This is the lie which will not die. The absurd historical revisionism that the Nazis were socialists. This is a pernicious myth which is peddled by the right, often frankly just to troll people on the left. The latest addition to this genre is an article written by Peter Hitchens in the Daily Mail. Hitchens who went from being on the revolutionary left uh, to a conservative. Now, firstly, it is a massive mistake, to say the least, uh, to simply take at face value how a regime or a political party describes itself. The Holy Roman Empire, as the old joke goes, was neither holy, Roman, or indeed an empire. East Germany called itself the German Democratic Republic. Does anyone think that was an oasis of democracy? Likewise, North Korea calls itself officially the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. You can describe North Korea as lots of things, but I think democratic ain't really it. In Russia, the most far-right mainstream party is called the Liberal Democratic Party. Does anyone think that this far-right, essentially fascist party in Russia, is liberal or indeed democratic? Now, as the historian Richard Evans put it, Nazism, in some ways, was an extreme counter-ideology to socialism. Now, what I'm going to do is start by explaining why Adolf Hitler, the genocidal mass murderer who ruled Nazi Germany and the countries that Nazi Germany of course, conquered between 1933 and 1945. Why did he call the Nazis socialists? Why was socialist in the name? Now, if we go back to what he was saying in 1923, before the Nazis, of course, long before they achieved power, or 10 years, um, what Hitler said was that German workers had two souls. One is German, the other is Marxian. We must arouse the German soul. We must rout, uh, root out the taint of Marxism. Of course, Marxism was his big bugbear. So he was asked by an interviewer back then, why do you call yourself a national socialist since your party programme is the very antithesis of that commonly accredited to socialism? Now, it, he just redefines socialism. He says it's the science of dealing with the common wheel. Communism is not socialism. Marxism is not socialism. The Marxians have stolen the term and confused its meaning. I shall take socialism away from the socialists. He says, socialism is an ancient Ary Aryan Germanic institution. Our German ancestors held certain lands in common. They cultivated the idea of the common wheel. Marxism has no right to disguise itself as socialism. Socialism, unlike Marxism, does not repudiate private property. Unlike Marxism, it involves no negation of personality, and unlike Marxism, it's patriotic. We might have called ourselves the Liberal Party. We chose to call ourselves the National Socialists. You see, what he's doing there is redefining it as a kind of going back to an old supposedly lost time, uh, which is the definition of being reactionary, which is the opposite of being a progressive. You're looking back to an old f period in history that you want to um, restore. And what he's doing is, is, tr is making it very clear that private property will not be attacked under what he describes as socialism. Now, socialism is about holding wealth and power in common. That's what it, in practice, is talking about, socialising what is called private property. So his, for him, private property is sacred. And that will come on to that because it will prove very important under the Nazi regime. Now, he goes on to make it clear that he ch they chose red to troll the left. This is what he said. He said, the fact we've chosen, this is Mein Kampf, not something I generally quote from. The fact we've chosen red as a colour for our posters suffice to attract them, by which he describes his workers, to our meetings. And, and he says, you know, that the ordinary bourgeoisie were very shocked to see that we'd also chosen the symbolic red of Bolshevism. They regarded this as something ambiguously uh, significant. The suspicion was whispered in German nationalist circles that we were merely another variant of Marxism, perhaps even Marxist subtly disguised, but better still socialist. The actual difference between socialism and Marxism still remains a mystery to these people up to this day. And um, so he goes on by saying... We chose red for our posters after particular and careful deliberation, our intention being to irritate the left. So as to arouse their suspicion and tempt them to come to our meetings, if only in order to break them up, so that in this way we got a chance of talking to the people. They were there, they were literally trying to wind the left up. This is what he's making clear in mind, uh, Kampf, but also trying to attract people, workers, ordinary Germans, who had been influenced or, 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 or were you know, loyal to left-wing parties to come to Nazi meetings instead and therefore they could convince them of the Nazi cause. Now, socialism, in its various different forms, is concerned with the unequal distribution of wealth and power in an attempt to correct it. Um, essentially, it's about social class. That's Class is the basis of socialism in its modern form. Now, Nazism 
repudiated class conflict. It hated the idea of class conflict and replaced it with racial conflict. So rather than classes having competing interests, the worker versus the boss, instead different races did. There was a racial hierarchy. Now, Nazis, of course, ranted and raved about rich Jews. So you might look at what they said about rich Jews and go, well, that's kind of anti-capitalist rhetoric. Well, of course, it wasn't because that was targeted specifically at Jews who they hated in general. And obviously, they specifically went uh, for rich Jews because they could demonize them specifically as having um, oppressed uh, um, those they regarded as true Germans. But it had no, they had no objection, no innate objection to rich non-Jews which we will come on to. Now, cooperation, of course, is the heart of socialism. The Nazis went for competition. Above all else, survival of the fittest. The strong will rise to the top and the weak, of course, will die away. That's not socialism, is it? Quite the opposite. Now, the fact that they were right-wing parties was recognised by other German right-wing parties. So if you take the German National People's Party, the DNVP, they were a hard-right party. Think of those in Weimar Republic, the interwar German Republic, as a bit like UKIP or the Brexit Party. They were monarchists, they were ultra-nationalists, they were pro-capitalist. Now they worked on and off with the Nazis after 1929. In 1931, they actually struck up a formal alliance. The Nazis did periodically turn on them, but only because they were determined to steal their voters. Because obviously those who were voting for the DNVP were natural fodder, voting fodder for the Nazis. And the more who voted for the DNVP, the more that reduced the overall voting tally uh, for the Nazis in competition with their rival parties. Um, now, the DNVP played a key role in bringing the Weimar Republic to its knees. Um, after the 1933 elections, which obviously laid the foundations for Nazi rule, they helped give Hitler his small governing majority. They voted for his regime. Hitler was appointed Chancellor by President Hindenburg, who was a traditional German conservative, who did certainly have originally misgivings about the vulgarity of the Nazis, but he was absolutely pivotal in, of course, directly appointing the Nazis to office. After the Reichstag fire in February 1933, which gave the Nazis a pretext to establish their totalitarian dictatorship, it was President Hindenburg essentially a hardcore conservative, he signed the Enabling Act, giving them absolute power. Now, the Nazis were aided and abetted by traditional right-wing parties and individuals, and they hated the left. Now, in March 1933, Dachau concentration camp was opened. Um, this was only weeks after they came to power. Um, and it was communists, socialists, social democrats who were originally targeted. Those were the uh, the, the original victims uh, who found themselves interned uh, by the Nazis. Um, and, of course, then what happened in later years, particularly in World War II, is communists, socialists and trade unionists were physically liquidated by the Nazis in their millions. There was the Nazi regime rested on the extermination of the left as a political force, trying to lump in the, the Nazis with left-wing parties and individuals who they physically murdered en masse is a pretty vile and disgusting thing to do, I have to say. Now, some will say, well, actually, the Nazis did have a socialist wing, the so-called Strasserite wing, see, the Strasser brothers. And that wing certainly did indulge in anti-capitalist rhetoric. I have to say, right-wing movements throughout history who we would regard as right-wing, and I need to be careful here because I'm not saying these right-wing movements are Nazis at all, but they, you, you've always had right-wing individuals and parties which will flirt opportunistically with anti-capitalist uh, rhetoric. At the moment, the Reform Party, not Nazis, not saying the Nazis, just being clear about right-wing, you doesn't, you know, adopting left-wing rhetoric doesn't mean you're not right-wing. The Reform Party at the moment is calling for public ownership of utilities. Reform is the successor of the Brexit Party. Is anyone going to start saying they're left-wing? If they are, they're being ludicrous. In any case, what happened when we talk about the left-wing of the Nazis, such as they existed, um, they were destroyed by the Nazis in 1934. So they had the leadership uh, of the SA, who were the paramilitary wing of the Nazis, who were on their side, Ernst Holm, etc. Well, they were physically, they were murdered at the behest and the encouragement of the German industrialists who helped the Nazis come to power. Now, that's what I'm going to talk about now. German big business. In 1932, 19 leading industrialists and financiers signed a letter urging Hindenburg, 
a conservative, to make Hitler chancellor. Now, the Nazis were in financial crisis by 1932. They had lots and lots of debts, and they were worried. But they ended up being bankrolled by major industrial concerns, not least IG Farben, the country's biggest corporation, which originally had backed the liberal capitalist German People's Party, um, but then they switched to the Nazis. They helped bankroll the fateful 1933 election campaign, which ended, of course, German democracy and ushered in the horrors of the following years. Um, and, you know, they, 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 they themselves purged their corporation, like many other businesses voluntarily did, of Jew Jewish workers. Or at least, sorry, they didn't resist attempts to purge Jewish workers and enthusiastically did so. Um, another was the Krupp family, a centuries-old dynasty. They made steel, artillery, etc. Um, the industrialist Gustav Krupp funded the Nazis too. Hitler made him the chairman of the Federation, representing businesses when Hitler became leader and then became its total Fuhrer. Now, in 1933, Hitler actually met secretly with the country's leading industrialists. And he said to them that private enterprise cannot be maintained in a democracy. So the point he was saying to them is the only way of preserving your big businesses is by supporting the Nazis. We will protect uh, your businesses because otherwise in a democracy, what will happen is socialism will inevitably occur. That's what he's talking about. What else does he mean? Private enterprise cannot be maintained in a democracy. And he promised that he would destroy trade unions and communists, who of course they feared, in exchange for their financial support. Well, of course, they were pretty keen about that and they raised three million Reichsmark for the Nazis. A lot of these business people did feel uncomfortable about the vulgarity of the Nazis and actually before this period were very uncomfortable with them. But you see, when they were faced with a choice between the Nazis and what they regarded as the revolutionary threat posed by the left, they chose the Nazis. So they might not have been like automatically keen on them, but their view was needs must. Now, August von Fink is another example, one of the country's leading financiers who joined the Nazis. He argued that Hitler had been sent by God to become Fuhrer of the German people. There's others like Ferdinand Porsche, who founded Porsche AG, Mercedes-Benz. He was commissioned by Hitler to make the Volkswagen, again, an enthusiastic Nazi. Now, Ger German industrialists benefited from Nazi uh, dictatorship. Uh, they did nothing as a whole, to save German Jews. They profited from slave labour and the Aryanisation, so-called, of Jew Jewish property. So Jewish businesses, of course, were expropriated. That wasn't socialism, that was just ra race war on the part of the Nazis. And those businesses were handed over to those non-Jewish Germans who were regarded as genuine Germans by the Nazis. Um, and, of course, they also benefited from the confiscation of businesses in countries invaded by the Nazis. Numerous companies directly profited from the Holocaust. The Holocaust was big bucks like Adler, BMW, Commerce Bank, Deutsche Bank, the German branch of Ford, IBM, IG Farben, Siemens. There was a huge number of corporations, companies, who benefited from Nazi rule. The idea that socialism, when you've got a load of big businesses who are literally being given slave labour and who economically benefit from the Nazis and become rich, what kind of socialism is anyone talking there? And workers didn't benefit because their, tra their trade unions were smashed, so real wages fell under Nazi rule. Some compensate by working longer hours because you had war mobilisation, but real hourly wages fell. They couldn't strike for better conditions. German businesses could profit at the expense of their workers under the Nazis. The Nazis also engaged in privatisation, very much against the trend of the period. So, as an article, uh, a very important article, uh, wrote, the Great Depression spurred state ownership in Western capitalist countries. Germany uh, was no exception. The last governments of the Weimar Republic took over firms in diverse sectors. Later, the Nazi regime transferred public ownership and public services to the private sector. In doing so, they went against the mainstream trends in the Western capitalist countries, none of which systematically reprivatized firms during the 1930s. Uh, and privatization in Nazi Germany was also unique in transferring to private hands the delivery of public services previously provided by government. The firms and the services transferred to private ownership belong to diverse sectors. Privatization, we're now talking, I mean, this, look, this is getting ridiculous and it will be get more ridiculous because we're going to completely debunk this. Um, the idea that a socialist regime engaged in privatization literally against the grain of the period, what, what kind of socialism are we discussing here? Now, some might go, well, economic controls, planning, forms of planning were introduced by the Nazis. Well, I mean, the Tory-led government in Britain did that in the context of war. They had massive state intervention in the economy. It was a capitalist economy mobilised for war. And the Nazis did that. Of course, they had a war. They'd mobilised for war in the 1930s before World War II happened. But, you know, a, a mobilised, a to, you know, a total mobilisation for the purposes of war 
doesn't negate capitalism. Otherwise, we would argue that Britain under Winston Churchill was a socialist country. It wasn't. And it makes a mockery of the term socialism to start throwing these words around um, in that context. Another point, that they didn't like the welfare state at all because you did get expanding welfare um, services under um, the Weimar Republic. They didn't actually like charity in, in, ideologically because, of course, survival of the fittest. The weak bring their own conditions on themselves. The, the, you, you, if you are... Uh, strong, then you will rise to the top. You don't help the weak because it's their own fault. That's the, I mean, that's integral to Nazi ideology. But of course, in practical terms, they couldn't just get rid of welfare provision because in a, you know, a country where you're suddenly in charge, ideology and reality um, are on a collision course. So what they did is they set up private charitable institutions, of course, organised on the basis of providing support on racial lines. But that was their kind of compromise on the basis that they didn't like the welfare state. So they'd set up private charitable institutions um, instead. That's not socialism. Again, now, social conservatism. Again, integral to what the Nazis did. Um, so marriage was aggressively promoted by the Nazis. They had this law for the encouragement of marriage. They provided vouchers um, for household goods for married couples. It was only originally if women actually abandoned work and became housewives. In fact, there was an aggressive attempt to drive women um, from work uh, to the house. Uh, they, women who had lots of kids were given the, the motherhood cross. Single men and childless families were heavily taxed. Abortion was criminalised. Later, of course, with an exception for children who were said to have defects. I mean, that was just in line with, you know, what they did to disabled people, which obviously, again, went against their view of, of building a, a master race. But they, they promoted, you know, the nuclear family where the woman would be a child raiser, would, be, uh, would, would bear children, raise children and not work. That was the ideological vision of the Nazis with the absolute total consolidation of... The, of, of the nuclear family and they did succeed in driving huge numbers of women away from work and back into the home later that became difficult because full employment was attained because of war mobilization and they needed whoever could work but that was their ideological aim now they shut down of course all gay spaces um homosexuality wasn't legal in the Weimar Republic but in practice um the laws were inconsistently applied and there was a thriving gay scene compared to most countries in the Weimar Republic. So what the Nazis did is shut down all gay spaces uh, and increase criminalization of gays who then faced mass murder in the Holocaust. Often you see huge numbers of gay people were killed. Now, if you compare this to the Russian Revolution, which cr decriminalized homosexuality in 1917 and allowed for abortion, um, I mean, you could then say, well, well Stalin went, uh, uh, you know, Stalin recriminalized homosexuality and abortion. Yeah, but he was departing from the original aims of what the Russian Revolution was. That wasn't consistent with the left-wing aims or left-wing vision that originally existed, which doesn't celebrate the nuclear family in the way that the Nazis absolutely idolised the nuclear family. This is just ultra-social conservatism. In what sense is that socialism? Now, some will obviously inevitably bring up the Nazi-Soviet pact, which was struck between the Soviet Union in 1939 and... And the molotov ribbentrop Pact, whatever you want to call it. Now, look, firstly, Adolf Hitler was always going to invade the Soviet Union. He made it very clear in Mein Kampf what he was going to do. He regarded communism as a, a, a existential menace, which had to be physically liquidated. And he regarded Slavs as racially inferior. And he wanted the East for Lebensraum, living, living space for those he regarded as pure Germans. Uh, and what he did was by time um and the idea was to defeat the west um and then when he th when he felt that he or well he actually wanted to ally with the british empire for a long time which is also forgotten but he he believed that when it was he wanted to end in a position where it was safe to invade the soviet union he made a mistake because he hadn't succeeded on the western front um, and actually that was a mistake he actually try originally he wanted to learn from the first world war which you don't fight a war on two fronts but he got cocky and invaded the soviet union in 1941 but he was always going to do that what, what, what about the soviets well look stalin was a mass murdering dictator just make that caveat very clear and it's not an apologism for the soviet union to point out that soviet foreign policy in the 1930s attempted to form alliances with france and britain against nazi germany that failed because of the policy of appeasement and the view of the Soviet Union was that France and Britain 
were going to try and drive Nazi Germany eastwards. And actually, that was the view of many senior right-wing politicians in France and Britain. That was better for the, you know, the, the, they preferred Nazism to what they regarded um, as Bolshevism. Now, the Nazi Soviet pact, in that sense, was when the Soviet Union gave up on attempts to form pacts with France and Britain and believed that was the way to safeguard um, their interests. That doesn't actually justify what they then did because their, that pact went way beyond, if you like, what, it, what a defensive mechanism. I mean, look, they committed terrible atrocities. It's like the Kachin ma massacre where 22,000 Polish uh, soldiers and intellectuals were murdered um, by the Soviets. But that wasn't because of an ideological affinity with the, with the Nazis. And that in, in no sense discredits or undermines the, the basic point that the Soviet Union under Stalin was a mass murdering totalitarian regime. It was just a different type of mass murdering totalitarian regime, which itself departed from left-wing principles, but we don't have time to talk about that. So let's be clear. The Nazis hated the left, and they specifically hated Marxism, which they wanted to physically liquidate, and they attempted to do so. They substituted race for class. They believed in ruthless competition above cooperation. They were funded and by and supported big business, who hugely profited from their rule, while destroying the left and trade unions. They conducted privatisation. They were ultra-social conservative. That One of the main reasons they hated the Jews, who they attempted to exterminate, and they killed two-thirds of all European Jews, was because they believed that the Jews were head of an international left-wing conspiracy. I mean, that was one of the main reasons. It was obviously based on 2,000 years of anti-Semitism, which predates even the existence of the left, but it was driven by a so-called conspiracy of Jews and Bolsheviks, that they were the same thing. International Bolshevism was just a Jewish conspiracy. What are we even talking about here? It is absolutely ludicrous to suggest that the Nazis were left-wing or socialist. There is no case to be made for the Nazis being left-wing or socialist, unless, I'm afraid to say, you are so stupid that you believe that just because, I don't know, East Germany called itself the German Democratic Republic, that we should take that at face value, or a fascist party in Russia calls itself liberal democratic, that we should believe they're liberal democrats. Obviously, words, what people call themselves, needs to be scrutinised. And I don't believe I have to say this, but I'm afraid if we do, you should not take what far-right extremists, fascists, and Nazis say at face value. Do I have to tell us, do I have to make that clear? But I think I've comprehensively gone through why there was no basis of any description to call the Nazis left-wing. They were a far-right organisation which took right-wing ideology to an extreme degree. And that caused the mass murder and extermination of tens of millions of people and the worst horrors in human history. Please like, subscribe, do support us on patreon.com forward slash I'll see you soon.